<laughs> Hi everyone, we're going to talk about Coca-Cola Company and we're going to present about the Hadley valuation. Uh, this is Mary, Saif, uh, Frank and myself, Oscar. And so through this presentation we're going to go through the company overview where we're going to talk about what uh, the essentially what Coke is the, stru the structure of Coca-Cola and then we're going to see a quick industry overview as well as the financial ratios. We're going to present you how we how we calculate the growth rate for the and then the and then and the WAC and the, the, the beta, and then we're going to present you the valuation methods that we use. So for the company overview, uh, Coca-Cola has has been around around 127 years. They're the largest manufacturer and distributor of beverages of soft drinks, and it's essentially their their most popular product, Coca-Cola, uh, is market leader in in, the, in in around 200 nations, and you can you, you can even buy Coca-Cola products in around 200 nations. Coca-Cola has around 500 500 brands. One of their one of their most popular ones are also market leaders in their own segments, such as Fanta and Sprite. And the 500 500 brands has allowed them to 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 target essentially any any type of customers. All right. Uh, as for the industry overview, um, we can see that um, uh, so there's like a lot of competitors. There's um, uh, the sort of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Dr Pepper, and Monster, and so the market value is almost 1.5. To, it's 1.5 trillion dollars, where it goes 80% um, of it is in developing and emerging markets, and the rest of the 20% is in the developing market. Uh, so currently, the soft drink uh, industry is a major dominant category, which includes the carbonated sports and energy drinks. Um, however, and also Coca-Cola and Pepsi combined hold 70% of the carbonated soft, uh, soft drinks market, and the rest goes to Dr. Pepper, Snapple, and Monster. Um, on a global scale, the uh, non-alcoholic beverage industry is estimated to grow to $2 trillion by 2020, from 1.5 in recent years. Okay, uh, time for some financial ratios. So, uh, to all the graphs you are going to see about Coca-Cola, there is a moment when uh, all the graphs changed sharply in 2017. Uh, that was sometimes seen the, the begin in the middle of 2016, beginning 2017, because Coca-Cola followed a method of uh, buying back uh, its shares very aggressively, which affected all the financial ratios. And uh, as you're going to see on the financial ratios for investment, the next fixed uh, asset turnover uh, increased signific uh, significantly un uh, until 2017 and then dropped again in 2018. Uh, the total asset turnover uh, turn over over did uh, the opposite and started uh, recuperating back uh, from 2017 to 2018, uh, going slower. Equity turnover uh, went uh, up sharply until 2017, and then dropped on, until until they finished buying back their shares. Now the current ratio, uh, the quick ratio and cash ratio, these are all uh, all the, ra the ratios that uh, have to do with their liquidity. As you can see over here, up until 2017, this was going uh, up, 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 until they uh, decided to pull pull back the cash because they bought a lot of their shares back. Represented all of them, but only one. That what did they do for the massive buyback? Uh, I think they were suffering to gain new in, uh, investors, or it was something that has to do with expanding even more to emerging markets. A combination <coughs> of both. Uh, that's that's what I read in one article in uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, so they they wouldn't they wouldn't elaborate more of that on their 10K report. I couldn't find anything. So is that if they want to expand, buying back shares, this is what you said, right? You can spend cash on investing. Right? Um, Any idea on why they did that? I mean, one option is just like they're trying to gain more control over their company. But other than that. I mean, was there something that preceded that? Like, you know, was there like a shock to the company, a financial shock? They wanted to retain their perception in the market, so they bought back a lot of shares, so that you know gives me well, 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 another, another, the, 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 the share being another thing. It, it looked like they were reaching a plateau. Uh, <coughs> for it looked like they were reaching a plateau before Coca-Cola is a very old company. 
and uh, maybe they wanted to try something new and recuperate because they, they were, they were, their graphs were flattening down. Do you have that in your report? Do you have some, some uh, observation on it? Uh, elaboration on the, on the buyback? Yeah. Mm, not yet, but we are doing... Why don't you try to see if we should find something and set it to me about Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, okay. Okay. Return on equity, uh, the same thing. Uh, the, the sharpness 2017, uh, simply because it seems to be going to the buyback and all that. That's, that's pretty, I mean, the fact that it's going to come a lot, obviously, is pretty yes. self explanatory. Yes. The equity is coming yeah, down. They're, they're trying to uh, now we're going to move uh, We're going to move on to the growth rate specifics and how we calculate the growth rate since Coca Cola uh, operates in multiple countries. Yeah, uh, so since Coca Cola is one of the biggest international companies in the world, we have that each, uh, some of the revenues in, can impact the growth rate for the for the sales earned in, for Coca-Cola. And so we can see that Latin America has 14.5%, uh, Asia 17.6%, Africa and Europe we put together as 26%. And North America uh, is the highest, is the largest revenue in uh, generation uh, with 41.9% uh, of the total revenue. And then to calculate the growth rate, we, what we did was to, was to based, on the, based on the growth per, per revenue for Coca-Cola, we we did a we did a, a weighted average, and for and so we can see that Asia that Asia North America Latin America is one of the highest ones for revenue for revenue for the revenue growth and we and with the weighted average we got a, a growth of three point zero three percent. Yeah, the calculation of beta, uh, it was a simple correlation between uh, Coca-Cola stock with uh, the S&P 500 uh, on five years on monthly basis from Yahoo Finance. So we basically took the, the growth, in, the closing, the, uh, <coughs> the monthly, yeah, closing uh, for, uh, 2014 to 2019 monthly closing price of the S&P 500. <coughs> Uh, I'm so sorry. It was weekly close yeah. price. That, that's uh, that's my type. Yeah. That's my type. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And when we took a slope between the S&P 500 price change rate and the uh, Coca-Cola price change rate, we came up with a beta of 0 0.51. Uh, Is that what you use? Yes. yes. That's our beta. If you look at the market, I don't it was like 0 0.27. It was really low, so we did this one and decided to use this one. <coughs> so uh, our um, WAG was 5.43%, and uh, here it shows how the cost of equity is determined. It's by the amount of shares times the current share price. That share price is from yesterday, 947.4. Now it's like 48.3. So, um, yeah, and the cost of that, uh, we uh, computed it due, uh, with the loans and notes payable, uh, long-term debt, including the uh, current portion, uh, which was equal to around 43,500. So that gives you the debt structure, yes. the debt ratio. So we will yeah. get here. Okay. So here we can see uh, it's, um, the weight is 82% uh, to 17%. And uh, uh, in order to find our return on uh, the required rate of return for our debt, we had we took three percent from the risk rate you gave us, plus uh, from the interest coverage ratio, we found out that uh, our um, multiple was nine point forty seven. So we added on top the uh, point seventy five percent. So we reached uh, three point seventy five. And uh, when we did the work formula, we got 5.43 for the rate. So the risk-free rate is just based in the United States? Oh, no, 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 no. So the, the risk-free rate uh, was based on 3%. Uh, so, sorry, the risk-free rate for the captain, we that's the 3.3%. That's, uh, that's the one we did for the regions, like uh, Oscar uh, explained earlier. So we took an average, and the 3.3 is the one we Just came up with. after that. Oh, sorry, after tax, correct? Yes. Okay.
So uh, our growth rate was 3.03%. So uh, we um, multiplied one plus the growth rate with the uh, cash from operations from 2018 for the f uh, following years. Did the same with the cash investments and we came up with the free cash flow. So at this point rate, uh, our WAC was 5.43%. Uh, so we uh, factored it over the years and divided it uh, with the free cash flow to get our present value of our free cash flow. Then we added all of them up to get the present value until Horizon 2022. And the continuing value is the la uh, Horizon's free cash flow times one plus the growth rate divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate. And this is the value we came up with. And uh, we then we took the present value of that, which is uh, the continuing value divided by the factor of the Horizon here, and that gives us the enterprise value, and, yeah. oh, yeah, sorry, so the present value of, uh, continuing value plus the present value up to the horizon. The value some, per share is $50. Yeah, this is what we <coughs> According to this model, it was a little bit uh, underpriced. Yes, according mm -hmm. to this share. Okay. According to this model, was uh, the, the share was quite the underpriced. Yeah. More so, is coming. Yeah. All right. So um, jumping to the withdrawal earnings. So first, uh, we had to find uh, the uh, payout ratio of the dividends on the previous five years from uh, 2018. So we uh, we found that uh, by getting the given ratios of EPS and DPS, then we divided the DPS by EPS of each year to find the payout ratio. Uh, as you can see, based on our calculations, in uh, 2017, they, as we mentioned before, they did an aggressive buyback of their shares, which explains the higher DPS ratio uh, to EPS ratio. So we did not take it into consideration as it will uh, discrepancy the, the values of the, the payout ratio. And then, um, so for the RE, we had to find, as before, the EPS, DPS, and uh, book the PPS um, from year 2018 to 2023. So what we did is uh, to take, uh, we took 2018 data and then to forecast EPS year 2019 to 2023, we took uh, the forecasted net income multiplied by uh, the uh, growth rate that we found at 3.03% and divided by the outstanding shares. And then, um, so to find the DPS, we multiplied the EPS uh, by the payout ratio we found uh, previously. And for the, D, uh, for the PPS, uh, we uh, basically took out the formula of, uh, so EPS minus the uh, return, uh, ROR uh, from uh, CAPM, multiply it by the book value of the previous year, plus uh, the book value of the previous year also. And um, also to find, so to find the RE, uh, we used uh, the EPS of the same year, and then we minus that from the BPS of the last year times the uh, rate of return of the CAPM, which is, was uh, 1.0. What did you use as a discount rate for this model? Yeah. Uh, 1.0 CAPM? The CAPM. The CAPM, yeah. 1.06078. Okay. And then for the, for the discount rate, uh, we just did the 1 plus the ROR, the rate of return percent from CAPM also. And then uh, to find the, the PV of the uh, uh, residual earning, we divided the RE over the uh, discount rate. And uh, for the total, oh. all right, for the total uh, present value of um, residual earning to 20, uh, 2022, uh, so we, did, we took basically we summed all the PV of the uh, residual earnings. And then for the uh, continuing value, we uh, basically took the uh, the uh, the end value of the uh, RE, and then we add the plus one plus the growth rate uh, growth rate divided by the rate of return minus the growth rate. 
and to, uh, to find the, pre uh, the present value of the continuing value, we divided the continual value we find, divided by the discount rate, and finally we found uh, the value per share, which is 39.363. For our last uh, valuation, we use the comparables multiples. And for our two major competitors for Coca Cola are Pepsi and Dr. Pepper Snapple. And what we did was to, to get the values for price to, price to sales ratio and price to earnings and price to books ratio. We have to get the first, we have to get the market value, the book value, which we got by using uh, total, total, total assets minus total liabilities, which equals uh, shareholders' equity. And then we got from the income statement the revenue and the net net earnings, and then we we multiply we divided the market value by the revenue to to get the price to sales ratio, and for the price to earnings ratio we got uh, we got it by dividing the market value by the net earnings and the price to book uh, <coughs> price to book ratio we got it by dividing the market value by the uh, by the book value. And then we got the average for the two comp uh, for the for the two competitors, Dr. Pepper Snapple and Coca um, uh, Pepsi. And then we multiply that by the by the numbers of sales and the book value of Coca Cola, which gave us this uh, following calculation for evaluation. And then we just did the average of that, and to get the value per share, we just divided it between the number of total of shares outstanding. And we got a four point sixty six, which is uh, over. We, yeah, it shows it's an overvalue. So, so our recommendations are with the with the three methods we use. The discount cash flow shows us that it's undervalued, and the residual earnings and comparable. What is it? Uh, the current For forty-seven. Should I go back? Do you want to see what we got? Oh, okay. So. <coughs> Um, yeah, depending on the method you use, we um, like two out of three. We say that it's overvalued, so we say that we you should sell. That's our recommendation. If we base it on two.